Hi, I'm Kinkas and I'm a synth DIY guy. And today we're gonna do something real fun. Go back to the breadboard. I have here my trusty Heathkit electronic design experimenter, which surprisingly, despite the fact that it's probably as old as I am, it works. I hadn't actually used it. A student bought it for me at a flea market and I hadn't really tried it and it works. The power supply, I've dialed it to be about 10 volts positive and negative, although for this circuit, we're only gonna use positive. So what are we doing here today? Well, we're taking a look at a magical IC, a magical integrated circuit called the CD4106. CD4106. It's known as a hex inverter, which basically is six Schmidt triggers. Now, this is a very common dip package. Let's put the little byte here so we know that this is pin number one and it's got 14 pins. So that means seven pins on each side, right? I usually draw it like this. One on each end, one in the middle, and then add two in between. And you have your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven right here. It goes around to eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. This is pin 14 over here. Now, 14 is where you apply positive voltage, right here. And seven is where you apply zero volts, also known as GND or ground. So this is how you power it. This is what it looks like. Even though we're gonna use it for some interesting noise-making synthesizer circuits, it is not required to use Eurorack type power. We're not gonna use positive 12 and minus 12 volts. We're gonna use zero and something like nine volts. So you could actually power this from a single nine volt battery, which is pretty handy if you're making something portable noise maker that you can take around with you. I've done a lot of projects using this chip. I've led workshops with designs that I've created using the 4106 hex inverter chip. And why is it so fun? Why is it so ubiquitous in uh, beginner DIY endeavors? Because I can claim without being afraid to be wrong that this is the simplest oscillator that you can make. Well, will it tune to one volt per octave that you can use to make Bach music? Probably not, but it's an oscillator nonetheless and one that only requires three components, basically three components. So apart from these two pins, which are power pins, all of the other ones, all the other pairs are inverters. The way you draw an inverter is like this, a little triangle. Now don't get it confused with an op amp, okay? It's a triangle, but it only has one input and one output, whereas an op amp symbol will have two inputs, one inverting and one non-inverting input, right? Here we have these little triangles. And notice that they're always facing the same direction. So if you have your pin one here on your left, every inverter triangle is facing towards the right. And this is what they look like. The inverter symbol itself will have a little, little thing like this, a dot on the output right there. Now, how do I make an oscillator with one of these inverters? Well, here's the input, here's the output. It's as simple as a capacitor to ground and a resistor from input to output. And voila, that's an oscillator. Really, that's it, it's that easy. You take a capacitor to ground from the input and you tie input to output via a resistor, let's call it R1 and C1, and here you will get a square wave output right there. How do you adjust the frequency? Well, the frequency is a function between the capacitor and the resistor. Basically what's happening is this is an inverter, right? So let's say that this output is high. When the capacitor is loaded, it'll let the current through, and this will be high. So this will invert and go low which will make the capacitor discharge. When the capacitor discharges, you get low here, which makes the inverter go back high, and so on and so forth, generating an oscillation. And of course, the speed of oscillation will depend on how much 
current the capacitor can hold, so how high a value capacitor you're using, and how much current is detained by the resistor. So the higher the capacitor and the higher the resistor, the slower the frequency. So here's a, a few things that one should know about the hex inverter. First of all, they're sensitive to ESD. So it's very important when you're handling these guys, as most CMOS chips are very sensitive to ESD, which is electrostatic discharge. That means static electricity from your hands, right? So if you're walking around on a dry rug, you might accumulate some energy that you will discharge when you touch the chip and it's very easy to burn these guys. So I use an ESD bracelet to avoid that. With the other end grounded somewhere where you know will discharge any static energy that you may be accumulating. The other thing is it only takes from 5 to 15 volts. If you underpower it, you'll starve it, which can be cool. You can get some cool results that way. But if you overpower it, you might burn it, okay? Now, ground unused inputs. If you have a floating input, it might just start oscillating on its own. So it's probably a good idea to ground any inputs that you're not using. And again, the inputs are the pins 1, 3, 5, 13, 11, and 9. If you're using the chip for less than six oscillators, you should ground the unused inputs. Another thing that you should know about this chip is it's putting out a square wave out of the output here when you have the circuit set to oscillate which again is as simple as a resistor tying input to output and a capacitor to ground but out of the input here you have a trianguloid wave sort of a triangular wave and I'll show you in a second the thing is though this square wave is nice and strong it doesn't need any buffering however this triangle wave over here is weak so this means if you want to use the triangle wave as a signal from your 4106 oscillator, you need to buffer it. So make sure to buffer it. And I will refer you to my video on the dead bug buffer so I don't waste time here explaining whatever I'd explained before. So if you want to know how to make a buffer using an op amp, it's very easy. You can go check out either my op amp video or my dead bug buffer video for that. Now what kind of fun things can you do with this thing? Well one of them is you can set up an oscillator and you can use different kinds of resistors to vary its frequency. It's harder to find variable capacitors so you can just keep the capacitor value but you can use all sorts of different resistors for this feedback here. Here's another thing that you should keep in mind with this chip. You don't want to short the input to the output. So if you're going to use variable resistors that may go to zero ohms, then you should definitely use at least a hundred ohm resistor here in series with any other resistors you may use so that if they hit zero ohms, you still have a little bit of resistance here between the input and the output. It's just good practice to do so. Now, I can use a potentiometer, for example, and the way that I'll use the potentiometer is as a variable resistor, not a voltage divider, meaning I will not use one of the terminals, one of the extremities. I will simply use one extremity and the wiper, and that will give me, let's say, 100K, that'll give me between zero and 100K ohms resistance between this point right here and this point right here okay and that is one really cool way to vary the frequency of my 4106 oscillator now another thing that i can do is use a ldr right which is usually this symbol right here and an ldr is light dependent resistor so that means that it will vary its resistance according to how much light is hitting the sensor. Now, here are some kinds of variable resistors. I can use a ribbon, like a soft pot, which is a position-based resistor. I can use an LDR, which is light dependent. I can use a potentiometer and just a regular resistor. And any other kind of variable resistors you can think of can be used as well. So I've gone and done just this over here on my breadboard. I did more. I did two oscillators here. So these are the schematics of the main oscillator that I've done 
right over here. So that, there's the, the chip right there, 4106, and I'm using the power supply from my heat kit, although I've dialed it down to 10 volts instead of 15. And right here in the board, first thing you notice is that big capacitor there. I put it there to smoothen out the power. There's also a jack that's connected to my Mordex Data oscilloscope. And from there, it's going into my audio system so that we can hear what's happening here. And now, right there on the first pin one and two, you see that green cable and the blue cable coming out. The green cable is going over there to where I have two cables connecting to that 100k ohm potentiometer right on my Heath kit. And that's coming back through the LDR right there, which is a light dependent resistor. And then that blue little blue cable at the end of the LDR is going back into the output of that first inverter, which is made up of pins one and two on my 4106 chip. You also have this capacitor right here, which is a one microfarad capacitor. One end of it is jumped to ground, right? which is pin seven on the chip is grounded. I'm using that same row for grounding the capacitor. And the other leg of the capacitor takes that little red cable right there to the input to pin one of the 4106. So that's exactly what's happening over here, right? So we're using pins one and two of the hex inverter chip. Now let's listen to it and look at it, right? As I turn up the volume here on my little amp, we start seeing that square wave and we start hearing as well. And here, since I've put the LDR in series with the potentiometer, both of them affect the frequency. As I turn it down, you go down low, down to actually clicking, which is like LFO range, right? Like earlier, I was getting higher pitch because there was more light. But I can still, by approximating my hand, make that oscillator go faster or slower, see? Now that in itself is pretty cool. It's what's commonly referred to as a light theremin. Usually when you see DIY projects called the DIY theremin, it's probably something like this, a 4106 oscillator that is controlled with an LDR, okay? Now I've made a second oscillator here, pins eight and nine of the hex inverter. This one actually has another capacitor here. It's a 10 microfarad capacitor. So it's uh, 10 times the value of this one. So right then we know this, the frequency is gonna be a lot lower. So this one is meant to be an LFO. And it goes through this 100K potentiometer that I stuck right on the board here. Basically the output is lighting this LED right here. So as you can see, it's so slow that it's like a slow blink definitely wouldn't hear that as an audio frequency at all. And as I turn this, this potentiometer here, it gets faster and faster and faster. See? Up to where you just see the LED constantly lit because it's blinking so fast that you can't really tell. Now, what's cool about that is that I can then turn this LED to face the LDR, right, of the other oscillator which is pretty much a homemade Vactrol, right? And now as I turn my volume back up and we listen to that first oscillator again. So let's turn this so it's audible again. And there you go. A voltage that I'm generating with this oscillator here is lighting the LED, which in turn is affecting the resistance and therefore the frequency of my audio oscillator. So basically I've created an LFO. So let's turn that frequency up. There you go. Now we're FMing that first oscillator right there. 
and I can still affect it unless I were to encapsulate that LED and LDR combo. I can still use my hand to put a shadow over the whole assembly. And now I'm affecting the frequency with both my hand and the LFO right there. And the LFO is simply being controlled by this variable resistance here, which is my potentiometer. Now all I'm dealing with right now are square waves because those are the ones that come out nice and strong from the 4106 inverters. But I could also use a triangle wave. So all I need to do right now is take this little red cable here and change it to the input. That's what that looks like. It's more like a shark fin kind of a shape. And it sounds much softer, of course, because it has much fewer harmonics. But it'll get loaded down easily, depending on where you plug it into. If it's not a high impedance input, it'll get loaded down and you lose signal. So make sure that if you want to use the triangle wave from one of these oscillators, that you do use a buffer for it. And that's it, that's a little breadboard circuit here using my Heathkit electronic design experimenter board. I have only used two of the six potential oscillators in this single chip. So one fun thing to do is to make a little module where you have potentiometer control over six of these oscillators and you can have them interact in different ways. You can use diodes and make them hard sync each other. There's a lot you can do with these and maybe I'll do another more advanced lesson about them. But for now, this is it. I just missed making you know these fun little videos with things that you can pull out of your drawer and have fun with and not just kit reviews. And this is one of the funnest things that you can do with Synth DIY when you're beginning is to just make oscillators with 4106 Schmidt trigger inverters. I hope this inspires you to have a little fun with your breadboard again. And if so, hit like, subscribe, leave a comment, hit the bell, join my Patreon, and that's it. See you soon and stay noisy.